Welcome to the Belly Button Window Channel and Episode 12 of the Jimi Hendrix Story, like you've never heard it before. In this episode, we examine each day in July of 1967, including the various gigs, recording sessions, concerts, and the critical events for that month. Please remember to check the channel's community tab and video information page, where you will find links to the related videos, performances, and stunning photographs from the period. Episode 12, July 1967, Saturday 1st of July, Earl Warren Showgrounds, Santa Barbara, California. The Jimi Hendrix Experience starts July of 1967 performing at the Ert Warren Showgrounds with support acts Moby Grape and Tim Buckley. And according to Noel, the band was paid $1,400 for the gig. Sunday, 2nd of July. According to Hendrix biographer David Henderson, earlier in the day Jimmy had borrowed Peter Talk's Pontiac GTO with Stephen Stills driving and with Mike Bloomfield, Billy Niles and David Crosby of The Birds, along with Jimmy as passengers in the car, was involved in an accident at a gasoline filling station in Malibu, causing the car to spin three times and resulting in an ankle injury to Jimmy. Later that evening saw the group performing at the Whiskey A Go Go Los Angeles, California, according to Noel. Our debut in Los Angeles at the Whiskey was a flop. We were too tired and too stoned. We could hardly stand up, much less play, and it didn't help to know we had a 10 a.m. flight to New York the next day. The gig was so bad that I broke my own rule and got pissed off on stage when Jimmy pulled a moody. Monday, 3rd of July. The experience flew into New York to be greeted by the same old nonsense. Their hotel refused them admission, so they checked into Lowe's Motor Inn on 8th Avenue. As ever, Jimmy was cool about the funny looks and loud comments the band always attracted, but Mitch was less philosophical. As he told a Melody Maker journalist, it's ridiculous people standing laughing at us at New York Airport when they're dressed in ill-fitting Bermuda shorts. In reference to the airport incident, Noel added, Sometimes attitudes of the States took me completely by surprise. Coming from uptight England, I was convinced that America had to be more groovy and hip. At the airport in New York, I was shocked when a terminally obese, balding man dressed in gaping, gaudily patterned shirt, plaid Bermudas and flapping sandals stood pointing and laughing at me. What is this? Where's the mirror? The Burning of the Midnight Lamp Earlier, while on a plane between L.A. and New York, Jimmy writes the lyrics for The Burning of the Midnight Lamp. By all accounts, he was exhausted and in low spirits as they boarded the aircraft for the 2,000-mile journey across America. At that point, the song had no lyrics. Jimmy went on to say, I wrote part of the song on a plane between L.A. and New York. There are some very personal things in there, but I think everyone can understand the feeling when you're traveling, that no matter what your address, there is no place you can call home. The feeling of a man in a little old house in the middle of a desert where he's burning the midnight lamp. You don't mean for things to be personal all the time but it is. The new and unknown version of The Burning of the Midnight Lamp In an article published circa 2005 by Joel J. Bratton, with supporting research by noted Hendrix biographer Caesar Glebeek, revealed the existence of a significant and hitherto unknown recording of the song The Burning of the Midnight Lamp that came to light via an offer for sale on eBay of a 15 IPS two-track reel-to-reel -reel tape almost certainly dating from June 1967. The contents were described as follows. The entire tape is in mono or extremely narrow stereo, is in excellent quality, ran for 10 minutes and 53 seconds in total length, although the center of interest. A complete version of the song, featuring harpsichord, electric guitar with wah-wah, spirited vocals, fine drumming and excellent bass, superior to the released version, runs just 3 minutes and 46 seconds. This recording also featured lyrics, slightly less worked. The vendor, a fellow by the name of Terry Corbett, having been involved in the music industry in the mid to late 1960s, claimed to have been personally given the tape by Jimi Hendrix late one night at Paramount Recording Studios in Los Angeles. The tape was eventually sold at a London auction house in June of 2004 for 20,000 British pounds. Later that evening, Monday the 3rd of July, the group plays the first of two nights at Steve Paul's Scene Club, 301 West 46 TH Street, New York City, performing for 45 minutes. The Scene Club. For some reason, New York did not have an equivalent of the ballroom venues of San Francisco or Los Angeles. Later on, there would be the Electric Circus and the Fillmore East, admittedly another theater. 
but in mid-1967, the scene was still centred around the old folk clubs and cafes on Bleecker and McDougall Streets in Greenwich Village. However, several of those like the Café Ogogo, the Café Waw, and the Night Owl had been featuring electric blues and folk rock bands. As with London, there was another type of club, the upmarket discotheque. Mostly they were uptown, places like Ondines and Cheetah, where Hendrix had occasionally played with Curtis Knight, and later the Salvation on Sheridan Square in the village. But what was to become their home away from home in the first place they played in New York was Steve Paul's Scene Club on 46th Street, between 8th and 9th Avenues, near Times Square. Many of these places may have been sweaty dives, but like Blaze or the Bagger Nails in London, they attracted a well-heeled hip elite audience. Variety magazine in the 12th of July of 1967 edition provided the following review of the experience's scene club performance. The trio pounds incessantly in tune with a contemporary format, and Hendrix attains far-reaching electronic tangents on his guitar. Supporting him are Noel Redding on bass and Mitch Mitchell on drums, a duo of Britishers who are well-schooled in achieving spike-driving sounds and appealing appearance. Enhancing the physical presentation is Hendrix's colourful bejeweled attire, which combines the aura of Jerry Lee Lewis with that of Liberace. However, for all the external personality, the root of the combo's appeal is its actual simplicity. As dynamite as they play and appear, they do so for entertainment. This is in contrast to much of today's music, wherein the artist seeks attention to the sociological, psychological and or musical composition of his material. Hippies will enjoy this opportunity to relax with performers they can accept, and teeny boppers should respond accordingly, thus transcending today's age-split market. The article includes the following critique. With these pluses, Hendrix should eliminate some extraneous output. His sexual gestures are vulgar and will embarrass youngsters besides being unnecessary. Tuesday, 4th of July. The group performs the second gig at the Scene Club with a 40-minute set and support acts, The Seeds and a Tiny Tim. It was later reported in Melody Maker, the 22nd of July, 1967, by Michael Whale. Hendrix broke several of his guitar strings while playing the instrument with his teeth, which caused road manager Jerry Stickles to run on stage like a football trainer with a new string every time there was a breakage. At a reckoning, they got through seven that night. Mitch has had this to say about the scene club. The first thing we did in New York was the scene club. How we got that, I don't know. Maybe Chaz knew Steve Paul, who ran it. It was a real sweaty armpit seller, but an incredible audience. Probably only held a couple of hundred people at most, legally. An amazing number of musicians would turn up there from Buddy Guy to Keith Jarrett to Chuck Berry. A crazy mixture often on the same bill and often playing together. It became the place to go. I remember Albert King playing there one night. He had his ridiculously long guitar lead, 50 yards or even longer. He ended up playing out in the street among the traffic. Absolutely absurd. Over the next year or so, it was amazing for us. Whenever we were in New York, we lived between the hotel, the record plant and the scene club. The scene was a watering hole for musicians, particularly English bands. It was the first place we really encountered groupies on a mass scale. One thing that impressed me with Jimmy, no matter where we were in the world, after we'd finished playing, we'd go out and check out whatever music was going on in town. Meanwhile, back in England, a notice in the London Evening Standard dated the 4th of July headlined, Jimi Hendrix sued for agreement breach, stating that PPX Incorporated of Broadway, New York, had issued writs in the High Court in London against Polydor and Track Records to stop them recording Jimi Hendrix until his PPX contract expired in October 1968. Wednesday, 5th of July. The Rheingold Festival, Central Park, New York City. Photos by Linda Eastman, Nay McCartney. During the day, publicist Michael Goldstein had arranged a number of interviews and also a photo session to take advantage of the group's much-talked-about Monterey performance. Rosalind Morris, a reputed love interest of Hendrix, is featured in various pictures with Jimmy and the experience, reportedly taken by Paul Popper, in a room of the Lowe's Midtown Motor Inn, 798 Avenue, NYC. The experience played the Rheingold Festival in Central Park, having been added at the last minute as support to the young rascals who were playing to their home crowd in front of 18,000 people. Stopping just shy of burning his guitar, Hendrix once again packed his dynamic stage show into the experience's 35-minute set. 
According to Michael Whale of Melody Maker, the experience won the night with the young rascals even booed during one number. Before the concert, Jimmy drove up to Harlem to meet with Faye Pridgen and close friends, twin brothers, Arthur and Albert Allen at Faye's apartment. Said to be gushing with pride, Jimmy excitedly shared the details of his British success and invited the gang to attend his Central Park performance that evening. Faye recalled, He was bragging and waving this album cover, and Jimmy was always ashamed to brag. Arthur Allen recounted, Jimmy had really known hard times, so for him to be famous out of all of us I believed it. I remember Jimmy with all his records. He would even get into white music, and when you found a black entertainer who would study white music, you knew the guy was serious. Like the great majority of black musicians, we couldn't have been bothered with the Beatles, let alone Bob Dylan. The Rheingold concert was also famous for another reason. During the first half of 1968, Australian artist Martin Sharp, whilst living at the Pheasantry, Kings Road, London, produced a stunning painting in acrylic of Jimi Hendrix, based on a tracing off of a live concert poster image by Linda Eastman, taken of Hendrix performing at the Ryan Gold Central Park Music Festival. A variant watercolour version was shortly thereafter transformed into a cover page for the September 1968 edition of Aussie magazine. It bore the title The Electric Circus, and an identical poster entitled Explosion was offered for sale around the same time. Thursday, 6th of July. Mayfair Recording Studio, Inca, 701 7th Avenue, New York City, the Jimi Hendrix Experience work on studio recordings for the burning of the midnight lamp. Noel noted in his diary, recorded new single again. The work on the burning of the midnight lamp began in May 1967, when the band recorded four demos at Olympic Studios in London during the sessions for the album Axis Boulder's Love, but was ultimately completed at Mayfair Studios, a small but importantly eight-track facility. It is believed that 30 takes and two reels of tape were required before the song was completed. The song features harpsichord touches. In addition, a wah-wah sound was tastefully incorporated, effectively doubling the harpsichord's introduction, and gospel choruses from the Sweet Inspirations were added to the mix. We had used female vocals before with Hey Joe, Chandler explains, and it seemed appropriate that we introduced them again. Gary Kelgren, the American audio engineer at Mayfair, and later co-founder of the record plant, whose wife Marta, doubled as the Mayfair secretary, had tracked down the sweet inspirations, Aretha Franklin's backing vocalists. Friday, 7th of July, Mayfair Recording Studios, further studio work associated with burning of the midnight lamp. Noel entered in his diary. Finished number. In between sessions, Hendrix and Redding checked out Frank Zappa at Greenwich Village's Garrick Theatre, while Mitchell went to see Miles Davis and Dizzy Gillespie elsewhere in the village. Hendrix immediately became fixated on Zappa's use of the wah-wah pedal for his guitar, and used one the same evening for overdubs on the new single. Frank Zappa has a war. In relation to the recording of Burning of the Midnight Lamp, there much debate about when Jimmy started using a wah-wah pedal. According to Noel, Jimmy had picked up a pedal in England around June, just before the experience set off for America. There are those, including Frank Zappa, however, who suggest it was following the Garrick Theatre gig, where Hendrix witnessed Zappa using one. The story goes something like this. After his encounter with Zappa, Jimmy may have taken a wah-wah into the studio at Mayfair to experiment with on the evening of the 7th, and in mid-67, it was still a bit unusual even for a Hendrix session to begin so late. Later, of course, it became standard, but it may have been that he was simply inspired by his experience at the Garrick Theatre to go in and play with the Wah for a few hours. The obvious thing to do, once he'd noodled a bit, was use the Wah Wah as an effect on an actual song, and Midnight Lamp was just sitting there waiting for him. Frank Zappa, interviewed by Steve Rosen, Record Review, June 1982, recalled, Jimi Hendrix sat in with us at the Garrick Theatre, in fact, he played my hollow body through a Fender Twin and got feedback out of that. All I know is he was working downstairs at this place, the Café au Gogo, -Go, and we invited him to sit in and he came upstairs and I let him use my guitar and he got feedback and went ape. I saw him at the Café au Gogo -Go when he played with us and at a pop festival in Miami where we worked with him. While Mitch Mitchell in his book stated, We did a couple of nights at the Café au Gogo. -Go. I remember that because Zappa and the mothers were in the upstairs bit the Garrick Theatre. I sat in with them once, and I think Jimmy may well have too.
Apparently, there was but a corridor between both venues. Also at the same time, Zappa was recording The Mothers of Invention, LP, We're Only In It For The Money, also at the Mayfair Studios, during which Jimmy participated in some of the photo shoots for the album cover, a parody of the iconic Sag G. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band LP. Jimmy appears on the right, not far from Zappa, in a blue mini dress. Photographs in the Apostolic Studios in New York, 1967. The Monkeys Tour. Jimmy had this to say. Then we got into a tour with the Monkeys. They're like plastic beetles. The Beatles are one group you really can't put down because they're just too much, and it's so embarrassing when America is sending over the monkeys. They're a commercial product of American show business. Oh God, dishwater. I really hate somebody like that to make it so big when they've got groups in the States that are starving to death trying to get breaks. So, earlier in the day, the experience, minus Chaz, who remained in Manhattan, left for Jacksonville, Florida to begin their tour with the monkeys. The experience were not even halfway through their opening number before the first wave of We Want the Monkeys rang out from the crowd. And although the monkeys themselves tried to make light of the situation, it was patently obvious their fans clearly hated the experience. The monkeys, in 1966, included Davy Jones, Peter Tork, Mickey Dolans, and Mike Nesmith. The made-for-TV pop group spawned a frenzy of merchandising, record sales and world tours that became known as Monkey Mania. Known as a made-for-TV pop group, who did covers of other people's songs and were suspected of not being able to play their instruments, they were nonetheless enormously popular with the teeny boppers. The monkeys were unhappy with that description, so engaged in a battle with their handlers to be allowed to write and perform their own songs, and at some point they sort of won and produced a number of original hits, though they still suffered the sting of being disrespected as instrumental players. So in late June 1967, starting at the Empire Pool at Wembley in London, and ending 59 days later at the Coliseum in Spokane, Washington, they undertook a summer tour which included 34 performances at 28 venues in 59 days and with the Jimi Hendrix experience supporting the Monkees for seven shows between July 8th and July 16th. So how did the ill-fated tour come about? There are various stories as to the tour's origins. Let's run through them. Early in 1967, while attending a party in London with Paul McCartney, John Lennon and Eric Clapton, Monkey, Peter Nesmith, heard a tape that Lennon had of Hendrix playing. At that time, Hendrix was already a star in England, but was still little known in the US. Nesmith and the other Monkeys thought they had found the ideal symbiotic relationship. Hendrix needed exposure in the US, they needed a connection with the real thing to give them credence as musicians. Their tour in December, January 1966-67 to 67 had produced a huge number one selling song, I'm a Believer. So it was arranged that Hendrix would open for the Monkees during the US phase of their tour. Then others say that the Monkees met with Hendrix in London during their tour of England in early 1967. They became immediate fans, and then after seeing him play at the Monterey Pop Music Festival in June of 1967, Mickey Dolenz and Mike Nesmith talked Jimmy into opening for them during their U.S. leg of the tour that began in Jacksonville on July 8th. Another version says that it was Peter Tork, who appears to have set the ball rolling, wanting to have some real musicians on the tour, of the kind he was used to hanging out with in Laurel Canyon. Mickey Dolans was also a fan of Jimmy's, having seen him in London, and he too was keen on the idea. The motivation for having Jimmy on the tour was an attempt to break out of the sub-teen market appeal to older teenagers and gain the acceptance of the rock establishment, while the Monkees producer, Tommy Boyce, lent himself to the following version. It was a personal trip. They wanted to watch Jimi Hendrix every night. They didn't care if he didn't fit. The tour promoter, Dick Clark, reluctantly agreed, and the wheels were set in motion for the inconceivable to happen. By then, the Monkees were such huge Hendrix fans that they showed up early to watch every Hendrix performance while on the tour. According to Chas Chandler, however, this is how it came about. In late June, around the 25th, Hendrix and I were sitting in my room. Mike Jeffrey got me on the phone and he said he had some great news. I have just signed them. The experience that is. On the hottest tour in America as a support act, he said. I said, that's great. Who is it? The Monkees. He replied. I dropped the phone. I couldn't believe it. I had this flaming row with him on the telephone. I went berserk. The tour was opening in Florida, I said. You can go on those effing dates because I ain't going. I'm totally disassociating myself from it. It's your F up. You take care of it. 
To Chandler, after Hendrix's triumphs at Monterey and then Fillmore West, it would have been wiser to package the experience, perhaps with Eric Burden and the animals, and send the tour out to clubs and small halls. For his part, Mike Jeffrey thought he'd brought off a coup. Whatever one thought of the monkeys, in America only the Beatles were more popular, and, to his way of thinking, it would be worth sacrificing musical integrity for the media exposure. But then again, to the older generation, Jimmy had teeny bopper status, irrespective of the music played. As Stan Cornyn, a Warner Brother executive, said, In those days at Reprise, anything beyond Dean Martin fell into one category, and the Monkees and Jimi Hendrix were beyond Dean Martin. Details of the tour. If nothing else, the Monkees drew huge crowds, 13,000 in Charlotte alone, but right from outset, it was obvious there was a problem. As Mickey put it, Jimmy would amble out onto the stage, fire up the amps and break into Purple Haze, and the kids in the audience would instantly drown him out with, We want the monkeys, we want the monkeys. So the perfect symbiotic relationship was not so perfect. There were two other warm-up acts. As the most important act, the Jimi Hendrix experience had been placed third, just before the monkeys. But the experience had come to see that position as the position of death, because by then, the monkeys' teeny bopper fans were out of patience and just wanted to see their idols. So in Greensboro, an experiment was tried. Hendrix went on first, and there was a significant improvement in audience reaction. In fact, at one point it appeared that the crowd might even rush the stage. But it was too late to save the lineup. After just seven performances, the last three at Forest Hills, the monkeys and the Jimi Hendrix experience came to a reluctant but amicable parting of the ways. This is how the New Musical Express of the 29th of July 1967 reported the story, Jimmy called Too Erotic by American Mothers. Jimi Hendrix withdrew from Monkey's tour of the United States. The official reason was due to a protest by the Daughters of the American Revolution, who are a group of American Mothers Guild-type ladies. The girls complained that Jimmy's performance was too erotic for young children. They say the average age of Monkey's audience is between 7 and 12 years. The fallout from the ill-fated tour. Mitch had this to say. Basically, the monkeys were trying to outdo the Beatles. Everything, but everything, was paid for by screen gems. I'd never been exposed to anything like it. They were a nice bunch of chaps, even though we thought they couldn't play. We shared the private plane and all that, but God, did their audience hate us. Eight-year-old kids with their mums and dads, no wonder they hated us. We just wanted out, basically, so Chaz had words with Dick Clark, the promoter, and then the whole Daughters of the American Revolution hype that is that we were corrupting their wholesome children was dreamed up afterwards. I don't think any of it was true, but some people had complained, and it got us off the tour, so I guess it was okay. There were some nice things about the tour. We did a couple of days on Greyhound buses, and we discovered that Peter Tork could play banjo, Mike Nesmith could play guitar, Mickey Dolans was one hell of a nice guy, and Davy Jones was extremely short. Jimmy had this to say. Don't get me wrong. I like the monkeys themselves. The personal part was beautiful. They're such good cats. I got on well with Mickey and Peter, and we fooled around a lot together. All these rumors about being segregated on the plane were just nonsense. We played seven performances with them, then pulled out of the tour, because there was a hassle. Firstly, we were not getting any billing. All the posters for the shows just screamed out, Monkeys! They didn't even know we were there until we hit the stage. Then some parents who brought their young kids complained that our act was vulgar. They'd say, What is this all about? Kids rushing that? Too erotic. We hadn't really played to that kind of kid's audience before. And you have to realize that though the parents of the kids in England don't interfere too much, the parents in the States are something else. We decided it was just the wrong audience. I think they replaced me with Mickey Mouse. And Noel's take on the Monkeys tour. We picked up and joined the Monkees in Florida. Our first show was 25 minutes long, playing to a strange audience for us, mostly girls aged 7 to 12, but we went down surprisingly well. Then we went out to watch the Monkees. It was awful to watch. Not that they weren't good, but they had a spare group backing their set from behind the stage curtain. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. There was something embarrassing about it for both groups. There were plenty of ups and downs on this tour, but mainly the latter. Monday, July 17th. Recordings at PPX Studio 76, 1650. 
Broadway, New York City. Curtis Knight says he met up with Jimmy at the Gorham Hotel in New York after the aborted monkeys tour. There, Jimmy went along to Mike Jeffrey's room to get some money and was told to go away. A few days later, he was in the gaslight with a big roll of cash paying off an old debt, but Knight maintains that the rebuff from Jeffrey sent Jimmy to Ed Chalpin to borrow some money. At their meeting, Chalpin tells Jimmy he was going to sue everybody in sight because Jimmy was still legally under contract to him. Even so, Hendricks agrees to do some recordings for Chalpin with Curtis Knight and the Squires. The following dialogue was recorded. Jimmy, you can't you know, uh, like if you use it, you can't put my name on the uh, thing, uh, right? Curtis, no, 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 hell no. In photographs of the first recording session with Curtis Knight, Jimmy can be seen playing a Hagstrom eight-string bass. Hendrix returned to PPX Studio 76 twice, despite legal action by producer Ed Chalpin of PPX Studios. Note, the famous contract signed on October 15, 1965, between Hendrix and PPX Enterprises, Inc. It is said that a guitarist named Shears played an acoustic 12-string guitar and that he probably participated in one of the two sessions. During this second session, Jimmy played guitar. This is confirmed on the available recordings. Jimmy maintains that he played bass, he says, sometimes the solo part, and sometimes I played the melody on a 12-string guitar. He did not participate in the overdubs of July 17, 1967. It is possible that guitarist Shears is the so-called unknown person who is visible in the photos, but this is not a certainty. All the names of the titles recorded on the covers of these discs during these two studio sessions are fictitious. They were all invented after Jimmy's death, except for those that were recorded in two sessions. The rest of the takes are cuts from jam sessions that were invented titles when Curtis Knight overdubbed songs from 1009. Tuesday, July 18th, Mayfair Recording Studios, New York City. Recordings The B-Side, The Stars That Play With Laughing Sam's Dice. The experience recorded overdubs for The Stars That Play With Laughing Sam's Dice at Mayfair Studios with Gary Kelgren as engineer. Mitch recalled that The Stars That Play With Laughing Sam's Dice was a deliberate joke, you know, STP and LSD. But it was just a fill done in one take with the background vocals done by the people in the studio. They were old friends of Jimmy's, like Devin Wilson. Frank Zappa attended many of the recording sessions at the Mayfair also, while Neville Chesters had this to say about the session and the Mayfair. Quite a few people dropped in on that session. It was a really shitty studio, it was about six or eight floors up, in Midtown New York, a pretty dreadful place. It was just like offices and they converted it into a studio most odd. I remember a photo session with Frank Zappa for the LP We're Only In It For The Money came out of that. It was the same day or later in the day of that session. Wednesday, July 19th. Mayfair Recording Studio Recordings and Thursday, July 20th, also at Mayfair, finishing the burning of the Midnight Lamp. Then, Thursday, July 20th, a concert at the Salvation Club in Greenwich Village, 40 minute set. The Salvation Club was reputed to have strong mob connections. Friday, July 21st, the Café A Go Go, New York City Two Shows. Café A Go Go was a nightclub in Greenwich Village located in the basement of the new Andy Warhol. Garrick Theatre Building, located at 152 Bleecker Street. Frank Zappa remembers. I thought Hendrix was great, but the very first time I saw him I had the incredible misfortune to be sitting close to him at the A Go Go, and he had a whole stack of marshals and I was right in front of it. I was physically ill. It was so packed I couldn't escape, and although it was great, I didn't see how anyone could inflict that kind of volume on himself, let alone other people. In that particular show, he ended by taking the guitar and impaling it in the low ceiling of the club, just walked away and left it squealing. Photos by Henry Grossman Saturday, July 22nd The Warwick Hotel for the 4pm wedding of Chaz Chandler and Lotta Lexon. Noel Mitch, Jerry Stickles, Neville Chesters and the Monkeys all attend. Jimmy did not. Also that day, it is officially revealed to the press that the Jimi Hendrix experience had left the Monkees tour by mutual agreement. Later, Café A Go Go, two shows 30 minutes each. Sunday, July 23rd, the Jimi Hendrix experience moves from the posh Warwick Hotel to the crappy Hotel Gorham. Noel records, a wonderful place with no air conditioning where I share a room with Mitch and Neville. Later, Café A Go Go, New York City, two shows. Keith Kaufman, 
was in the audience that night and recounted, I saw Hendrix at the Café Ogogo in New York City around July 23rd. I got a seat in the front row and wound up sitting next to Eric Clapton, who came to hear the experience, as he was a huge fan. Eric was with a tall, pretty girl, Charlotte, with long hair, probably his girlfriend at the time. I muttered a few words to him, are you going to jam tonight? Or something equally sophomoric, but did not think that much of the incident at the time. Hendrix's set, which was about an hour and was incredible. Hendrix appeared to be drunk, but he didn't seem to take anything away from the emotionality of his playing. He played mostly straight blues numbers such as Red House. Hendrix used a Fender Strat with single Marshall stack. Tuesday, July 25th, Noel Redding participates in a photo shoot for the Swedish guitar firm Hagstrom. Wednesday, July 26th, the experience is photographed and interviewed in an antique store in New York. Photo, Jerry Schatzberg. The later is photographed at the House of Oldies Record Store, 267 Bleecker Street in the Greenwich Village. Photo, Ira Rosen. Later that evening, Jimmy participates in a jam session with John Hammond Jr. at the Gaslight Cafe in Greenwich Village. July 28, 1967, Gaslight Cafe, Greenwich Village. Jimmy takes part in a jam session with John Hammond Jr. and his Screaming Nighthawks and Eric Clapton. John Hammond described that evening. I had set up a small trio and we played together in the same club, The Gaslight. There was Charles Otis on drums, Lee Collins on bass. I had met Eric Clapton in 1965 on tour in England when he was playing with John Mayall. Eric was in town with Cream and Jimmy had just finished touring with the Monkees. They came to The Gaslight at the same time and we played together every night for a week. It was a small club that could only hold 60 people at a time. So... A lot of people who were on the bill over the years came up to me to tell me that they had seen me with Eric and Jimmy. Yes, we were there. When I tell this story, some people don't believe me and yet it's the truth. Saturday, July 29th, Mayfair Recording Studio. Finished the B-side single The Stars That Play With Laughing Sam's Dice. Noel records in his diary, wrote Little Miss Strange at the session. Monday, July 31st, PX Studio 76. Recordings, No Business, Future Trip. Day Tripper, Get That Feeling, UFO Oddball, Flashing with Curtis Knight, a.k.a. Curtis McNear. This entire recording session features the fact that Jimmy plays on a Hagstrom 8 string and has a bass fuzz box. An unknown musician plays a 12-string electric mandolin. The material recorded over these two days has been released on countless albums over the past decades. Teen Scoop magazine published in its January 1968 issue a photo of the experience with the members posing on a wooden staircase. This photo appears to have been taken outside, and judging by what the guys are wearing, it looks like this photo was taken around the end of July 1967. Jimmy is wearing an orange striped shirt, similar to the one he wore in Monterey. Of particular note is Mitch, who is wearing a jacket with a badge, the same one he wore to Chas Chandler and Lottie Lexon's wedding on July 22nd, so this photo must have been taken around that date. Also, Jimmy's pearl necklace with an amulet suggests this period. That concludes episode 12 in this series. Stay tuned for the next installment. Please remember to check the channel's community tab and video information page, where you will find links to any related videos, performances, and stunning photographs from the period and any updates. Also, don't forget to subscribe for future content updates. By the way, if you have any stories or anecdotes to contribute, we would love to hear from you. Lastly, thank you so much for your wonderful comments and continuing support.